Coming up, she was full of life on the outside, but on the inside, she was slowly dying. And author Danielle McCulley discusses her third and final family devotional in the Table Talk series. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. Hey, Bill, how did you uh, spend time with your kids, like your family particularly around maybe devotion time? Did you do that as a family? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I love this table talk concept that we're gonna talk about today because we talked a lot at the table. We were very intentional about that. But I also loved reading stories. And I even made up my own stories at night. So family devotions are critical. I bet you that story was incredible. Well, kids can you get us talking my kids. about today? They, they do, actually, they do. <laughs> well, first things first, have you ever heard of the Table Talk series, right? Part one and two featured short, funny family devotionals that start with a real life kid's quote. They are often hilarious and transition from an aspect of that quote into a thought about God or life and turn it towards a biblical perspective. Backed by popular demand is part three and we're joined by the author and co-host of A Better Us, Danielle McCulley. Welcome, Danielle. Welcome back, I should say. Hello, Lori and Bill. Thank you for having me back. Well, you know what? I just love this series called Table Talk. Uh, it's a great resource for families. This is your third book in it that is. series. And tell mm -hmm. us uh, why you started writing these books and what ages they're written for. Yeah, so just actually right now in my living room, I have hundreds of books stacked up to be sent out of Table Talk 3. Uh, I have them here, but I also have one and two. So you're right. This is the third uh, project. And I'll tell you, before I was an author, I was a mom. And I was looking for resources, for tools that I could use to engage my own kids. And what I found was, you know, we did a few here and there. And then there was just really, um, I was having trouble finding something that would really engage my boys. Um, and also, I live with three men, two yeah. little ones and one not so little one. And it is hard to pull conversation out of them. And so that's why I called it Table Talk. It was um, intentionally a little selfish for me to write for my own family to draw conversation out of them and meaningful com uh, meaningful uh, memories around the table and biblical truth but I, I hope it blesses other families as well as much as it has us oh I'm sure it will and you know I love your approach because you start with humor which is a great place to start yeah. Especially when you got boys around your table, right? And the, exactly. you quote the funny things kids say. And when I was reading through it, this one really made me laugh. The kid said, uh, mom says, I'm going to miss you when you go to kindergarten, honey. And the little five-year-old responds with, I'm going to miss you too, but it's a chance for me to have a better life. Like That's, that's right. That's <laughs> hilarious. Why is yeah. humor so important in our families? Yeah, so we always say we will use anything it takes to draw kids in and to teach them about Jesus and, and to have a love for the Bible. So we're going to get in on their level. Um, I can't promise that every single devotional will have 100% uh, appropriate dinner conversation. Uh, there, there may be a little bit of uh, fun uh, in the pages, but that's what we want to do. We want to get them hooked and do a little bait and switch and use, we always say, we'll turn boogers into Bible. If you want to talk <laughs> about boogers, we'll do it and then we'll turn it into Bible teaching. And um, so that's just what I wanted to do was engage my own kids, um, help other parents engage their kids. And then, um, you know, it's just quick, easy, fun, little devotionals that turn into open-ended conversation. There's some conversation starters um, that I hope will add some fun and, and conversation around the table, yeah. Well, it sounds like you've been sitting at our table you know, because uh, those kind of conversations, it's very real. And I love that you engage kids with the humor and just there's a lot of creative ideas because honestly, I think sometimes we are far too serious in our family. So I yes. really appreciate that you, you're you using that to engage everyone in the family. So tell me, what are two or three key topics that you cover in the book and why yeah. are they important? Okay. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say it has been a couple of years, hasn't it? It's been a hard couple of years for family. And for so sure. I hope and I want these books to add some new life uh, and make new fun memories for families. And um, so that's really my heart behind it. But so we start off with um, really uh, practical topics, things like 
rules and why we have them and uh, you know healthy habits developing healthy habits how about conflict resolution so things that we deal with in our home and what does God and what does the Bible say about those things but then also just some real foundational um, biblical truths things like grace and miracles and who we are in Christ and who Jesus is um, so there's a mixed bag of all things that I hope will be really relevant to every family. You know, that's so good because you want to talk about those things like rules, mm -hmm. but you want, sometimes you don't know how to approach it, right? Do you find that this, it, this tool, in essence, is enabling parents to have conversation with their kids about important topics that maybe yeah. they wouldn't normally go there? Exactly. And, you know, there, there's um, been obviously thought put into this from my end. So let's research and let's find out why our rules to, uh, you know, taking that example, our rules to just take away the fun. No, rules are actually boundary lines that help us to contain the fun, to keep the fun from running out. Because sometimes when we cross the line, then the fun runs out. And um, obviously we talk about um, why why God gives us those tools. Um, and so uh, those are just some topics that will help parents. Um, I give them the, the beginnings, the breadcrumbs, and then hopefully they can keep going and um, just use it uh, for open-ended dis discussion around their table. Yeah, as you said, conversation starters, which I know when my kids were young, we uh, often used devotional books and it was a great way to engage everyone in conversation. I got two boys and a girl and I agree with you, it, you have to work at pulling things out of your boys sometimes, you know, so, and Amen. my daughter. Yep. Well, thank <laughs> yeah. you for this, this amazing tool. What's your hope um, for families that use this devotional book? Yeah, I mean, I hope again, it was a selfish tool for me, and now I want to put it out there for other families because it's helped us so much to um, share our thoughts, things that we would never even think to talk about, um, and to just have meaningful moments. There's even fun little games that um, I leave for the end of each devotional that just have some you know, crazy things uh, around the table that we can look back on in our life and go, hey, remember when mom and dad tried to race and do this fun thing? Or remember when we had a contest to see who could finish the broccoli first or whatever it may be, um, allowing families to have those memories while building biblical truths that will last forever. And God says, train them up in the way that they should go and they will not depart. And that is my hope. Well, I think it's fantastic. You know, life is busy and can be hard. And to navigate with, as a parent, we need tools. So thank you, Danielle, uh, for creating this once again, a great resource. If you want to get a copy of Table Talk 3, go to 700club.ca. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, Lori. It was great chatting with you. You too. And now the facade of success wears off, leaving Tom searching for something more. There were times we'd come home and mom was fine, and there were times we'd come home and we thought mom was dead. From an early age, Tom Blee tried to escape his dysfunctional home. With an alcoholic mom and a workaholic dad, Tom quickly learned to shoulder his own burdens and keep his emotions in check. I mean, I can remember as a first grader going into school and one of the nuns coming up to me and saying, Tom, is your mom sick again? And even as a child thinking, you gotta hide this. And that anxiety that was put into my head at a young age, I mean, that's the buzzing, that's the clanging, that's the unrest. Tom felt more and more pressure to be perfect, so he projected an image that everything was fine. Yet nothing relieved his growing anxiety, not even God. I can remember in church many times looking up and saying, there's the Savior that is supposed to save me hanging on the cross who never comes off the cross. At 16, Tom decided religion was pointless and stopped attending church. It seemed to him that he got better results from his own hard work. I don't need this God and this Jesus, and I just need my books, and I need to pick my career, and I need to get out of this house and get on with my life. Growing up in the shadow of the Mayo Clinic, Tom was drawn to the lifestyle of the doctors and their families. How come I can go to people's houses and it's not dirty? The search constantly to find that area of peace, the doctor's family seemed to have peace. So Tom decided to be a doctor. He did well at college and med school, but the pressure to succeed and keep up a perfect facade fed his anxiety. The uneasiness was there, the need to succeed was there, that buzzing in my head was there. 
Tom graduated med school and married a nurse, hoping to achieve the ideal family life he never had. It just didn't work. We were kind of the same people. She grew up in bad alcoholism with, uh, with her father. I grew up in bad alcoholism, and we're very comfortable with chaos. That's what we've grown up in. Soon, Tom found himself escaping as his dad had, working long hours and isolating himself at home when arguments arose. If the heat was turned up, I would run and hide. For over a decade, Tom worked to maintain his perfect image of success. However, behind closed doors, his marriage was crumbling. We had the house, we had the cars, we had all this stuff, and it was empty. It was exhausting, and I don't even know if exhausting is a big enough word. Then, the evening of March 1st, 2014, Tom finally faced his failures. Overwhelmed, he called his sister, who had given her life to Christ, and she urged him to get to know Jesus. And I hung up the phone, and I sat in this chair in this kind of dimly lit room, and I looked up and said, I don't even think you exist. You know, and I said, I'm so done with this, everything that's happening, that I'm gonna give you one more shot. And I got on my knees and I said, you know, if you exist, you have five minutes to show me because otherwise I'm tapping out. And I stood up and instantly felt different. A, there was a presence in the room and B, that buzzing stopped. There was finally lightness, so to speak. There was something like lifted off my shoulders saying, stop the struggle, you got help. That night, Tom bought a Bible and started reading. The more he learned about Jesus, the more peace he felt, and the more he realized that Jesus was much different than the man he'd seen always hanging on the cross as a little boy. He came down as a helper. He came down as someone to heal. He's completely different than the man on the cross because he's present. He's here, can ask, shows up, alive, dynamic. Tom started attending church and Bible studies. As he grew closer to God, he stopped striving to be perfect and sought God for help with his problems. Even though his marriage ended a year later, Tom had hope in someone greater than himself. All I could do is say, I have nothing right now but you, God. Something is happening and I trust you. Today, Tom's a trauma surgeon at the seventh busiest trauma center in the country. Yet with all that pressure, he doesn't worry because he knows Christ is the ultimate healer. My work as a surgeon is constantly cheating death. And I know someone out there that actually can bring people back from death. I mean, that's what Jesus is. You are a new person. You get a new life. You get a second chance. You get hope. Doesn't mean I don't have challenges and trying times and so on, but that buzzing is gone. There's a peace there. Everything is fixable through Christ. Tom had it right. To paraphrase him, he said, trusting Jesus doesn't mean you won't have challenging times, and we all know that, but there is a peace. So what did he mean by that? Well, I think Paul explores this in the book of Philippians chapter four, where he said, do not be anxious about anything. And you say, sound, like, that sounds like a crazy ideal, but how do you do that? Instead, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, here's what I've learned about life, and Tom learned it too, that in the storms of life, and we will have them, but in those storms, you are not defenseless. There are two things you can do. The first is to present your requests or your needs to God. You see, peace begins by believing that there is something greater than the storm you are in. If you've ever flown in a plane, my, my father-in-law is a pilot, when there's a storm, you can fly above the storm. If you can get above the storm, it is calm. And in the same way, when we pray, when we present our requests to God, it gives us the opportunity to see his perspective, to find his calm, even though the storm is still there. And the second thing Paul says is then allow the peace of God to guard your heart and mind. This word peace in the Greek is really interesting. It's a compound word. It's two words meaning join to the whole, literally to be made whole. And I thought of the illustration of a ship in a storm. If a ship is drifting towards shore and is gonna be beached or wrecked against the shore, they drop an anchor, and that anchor connects to something that is whole, that is solid, the ocean floor, and it preserves them. So, can I ask you a question? Do you have peace? If not, learn to present your requests to God and join your life to God's power and His presence. 
And if you need help with that today, we'd love for you to call us at 1-855-759-0700. We have this great resource called Peace. We'd love to put into your hands and pray with you. And now, this is how Paige was brought back from the brink of insanity. When you first meet her, you'd never know. She's beautiful, articulate, a caring mother of two children. But Paige Torgerson has a dark past, and there's a reason she wants you to know her story. Things that happened that I didn't really see as, as abnormal because I didn't have a normal picture of life. Normal to Paige was a mother who married six times. She thought she was making the right decisions. She thought that each marriage was the right thing for us. Normal was a biological father who drank until he passed out every night. He would say that um, his life was just not worth living and, you know, part of it was my fault. It was my mother's fault. Then Normal became a succession of stepfathers and stepbrothers who used Paige as a sex object and her mother as a punching bag. I would walk in the room and he would be hitting my mother. I would try to defend her. And so then he would start abusing me. He would spank me until I used the bathroom on myself. These images are picture perfect. Paige is a six-year-old celebrating her birthday at nine with an impish grin. As a teenager, cheerleader and homecoming queen. But the girl who looked so full of life on the outside was slowly dying. I was um, constantly in fear. I began to just take everything in and put it in a different place so I wouldn't have to think about it. And that's kind of the way I would paint the picture to the outside world. I would never tell them what was really going on on the inside. She broke free from the abuse after high school graduation, but the damage was done. Paige began to repeat the same tragic mistakes as her mother. I chose the same, same type of people that I had been around for so many years. Then she had her first child, a daughter, still hoping that a better man would come along. And I thought, well, this next one, he's going to be the one. And then there would be that moment where we, everything would go south, and I would say, I'm not going to do this anymore. One boyfriend did seem different at first. They even had a son together. But this man, while not abusive, eventually taught Paige how to destroy herself. He introduced me to drugs, yes. And that became my escape. I had hit bottom with that, and, um, and I couldn't function anymore normally. That's when Paige says she first heard the voices. Telling me to kill myself. Um, it got to the point where the voices were telling me to kill my family. The voices were telling me to kill my daughter. And see, my daughter was the love of my life. I would never do anything to hurt other people, and I had always guarded other people. So these voices began to get worse and worse, and I would put my hands over my ears, and I would say, stop that, stop. I thought I was going crazy. I thought that I had lost my mind. After five months of torment, Paige quit all drug use, and the voices? The same day, as a matter of fact, that those voices stopped, that night was when the Lord intervened. It was the most angelic, the most peaceful, loving voice. You, can, you just can't even imagine. I knew that God was speaking to me. His presence was overwhelming. I was in the very beginning fearful, but then suddenly the fear was gone. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. It's like I had a, a sudden reverence for God that I had never known. He showed me moments from my childhood and how bad decisions had opened the door along the way for the demonic realm to control my family. Paige says the vision that followed was horrifying. Suddenly, I was in a holding cell. I was in a very dark, dank, really, really scary place. And I was saying, why am I here? Lord, why am I here? Because I thought that he had come to rescue me. And I thought I had died at that point. 
but I couldn't touch anything. I couldn't feel anything. I could hear these moans and these cries and voices, but I couldn't see them. It's like they were tormenting me. I remember having no communication at that point with the Lord. He didn't answer anything I said. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I immediately knew what eternity was. Uh, there was there was no sense of time whatsoever. I could hear people crying and, and wailing. And I thought, that's my funeral. I'm listening to my funeral. I walked to the door, and as I opened the door, I started to step outside, and I was shocked. But I could see a beautiful scene outside. But inside, it was very dark, very scary, and no sense of life whatsoever. That was the moment where I understood what death was. I tried to cry. It was very clear in my mind that I totally miss God. I could see very clearly visions of the party scenes, the, the sexual perversion that I had participated in, the things that I had done willingly. I could not remember anything at that point from my childhood, anything before I became accountable for my actions. And I remember trying to cry out to God and begging God for another chance. And I started screaming and crying and I said, Oh God, you gotta get me out of here. You gotta get me out of here. I, I am in hell. I had a very real picture of hell, the damnation that I could have experienced. Where does a person go after a vision of hell? Paige says she didn't know where to go or what to do. Honestly, I didn't know that I had to pursue him. I didn't know that I had to desire a relationship with him. I had to find God. I had to have that joy and that love that I had never felt. I had only felt that love during that visit with him. She began her search for God in earnest. I was reading the Bible and, and praying and, um, and I began to fast and suddenly God stepped back into my life in such a great way. And he said, I was waiting on you. I've been with you the whole time. And I was waiting on you. And when I realized, wow, it was my choice. You went out of your way to visit me and to tell me all these wonderful things and to show me what I could have never known. And you're here again and I am never, ever going to lose you. So I started sharing everywhere I went. I would tell him how much I loved him. He was everything to me. Um, I would say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. The repentance was very important. Paige found a church and grew in her relationship with God. She reconciled with her father before he died and she's forgiven those who abused her in the past. Today, she has a wonderful relationship with her mother, who became a Christian too. Paige believes she was spared an eternity in hell. That's why she is so passionate to tell her story. I want to shout from the tallest mountain that people have no idea what happens when they leave this world. They take their last breath. There's no way out and it is terrifying. If your heart is right, if you really want to get right with the Lord, all it takes is that prayer and the repentance. I've never known love or had an identity until now, and my identity is in Christ. I had never known there was so much joy and love in a relationship with God. In knowing Jesus as your Savior, and changing your life, allowing Him to come in and transform your heart and change your life. There's nothing that words can't describe it. In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. Believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today.
Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to those who have chosen to be a partner with us. We're so grateful. And I invite you have, who have not yet joined us to join us. We make it really easy for you to give. All you have to do is sign up for Pledge Express. It's the easiest way to ensure that every dollar goes to those who need it most. And it saves costs for the ministry as well. So why don't you call us today? And as a thank you, we're going to send you Pat Robertson's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. Don't hesitate. Let's do this together. Call 1-855-759-0700. He's the most mysterious member of the Trinity. He's the power of God in the world today. He's with us and in us to defend us, comfort us, and guide us into truth. He is the Holy Spirit. Get Pat Robertson's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, available now. Boy, I think with everything that goes on in our life, no matter what you know season you're in, mm -hmm. you really need peace, right? It's a desire for every single person. Yeah, and I, and I think in Philippians where it says a peace that passes understanding, I've just learned that it is, it is supernatural. Yeah. It's not natural, because in the natural, if you just go by what you see, all you see is chaos. Like watch the news, listen to people talk, but there's a peace that's accessible to you that's beyond your understanding because God sees not only what you see right now, but he sees past, present, and future, and he promises to work it all out. And so for me, peace is knowing the end of the story. It's like if you ever watched, or if you ever cheated reading a book and you read the end, it kind of yeah, takes yeah. some of the it's drama, true. the crisis yeah. out of the middle, right? Because you know how it's resolved. Yeah. Well, we know that as followers of Christ. We know God wins. So that's the peace yeah, that true. I think we need. I was thinking as you were telling your story about your father-in-law is a pilot yeah. and you can fly above the storm. Yeah. Of course, I've been on many planes and <laughs> been above the storm or coming through. And I thought, you know, when you're on the ground and you look up, all you see is the storm. That's right. And you don't even sometimes realize that there's something above it. And anyway, I just really appreciate that reminder. Like God is always above the storm. Well, and sometimes you miss the sun for the clouds. Yeah but the sun never moves. Yeah, that is right. so true. <laughs> well, we have some great yeah. partner comments. And John said, thank you. We appreciate these, by the way. John said, I'm always blessed by your program and the resources you provide. I also love the testimonies. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Yeah, and Faye said, I give thanks for the work you are doing. It is a joy to be part of God's work. Well, thank you, Faye. And we really believe that we are doing God's work. So again, if you haven't joined us as a partner, please do that because it would just mean so much and we'd accomplish more together. Yeah, 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times. And in every way, the Lord be with all of you. What a great way. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, a young girl leaves religion behind for love, and a 10-year-old refugee stuns the chess world.